Well, welcome, bienvenidos to today's core training on using core tools to develop your proposal. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates our countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We will be your hosts and trainers today. And as you can hear, these events are held bilingually in English and Spanish with Spanish interpretation thanks to our team members, Stella Larman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. We're going to ask you to complete a poll to let us know which of these tools you've used, and I'll turn this over to Nicole Young, and she's gonna walk us through an overview of CORE before we dive into some of the tools. So thank you, Serge, Recovery Cafe. Learning stuff to make a better application, absolutely. Great, and when you have introduced yourself in the chat, then take a look at the poll that we have up here. Uh, we're gonna cover four specific CORE tools today, the CORE results menu, uh, strategies and program outcomes menu, core continuum of results and evidence and the promising practices database. So we're curious to know which of these tools have you used at least once before today's training. So we'll give you a few seconds to take a look at that and answer that will just help us know who we're talking to today and how much you might already know. I'll give it just a a few more seconds before I close the poll, just to see if anyone else is going to answer. Okay, it looks like maybe everyone that's answer, going to answer has already answered. So I will end the poll. Oh, just in time, that last response came in. And so we can see, I'll share the results here. Uh, we can see that some of you have used the core results menu before and the promising practices database. That's great. And um, at least one of you has said none of the above. So we're glad you're here. And then the strategies and program outcomes menu and the core continuum, uh, no one has used yet. So you were in the right place today. And we will uh, show you in a moment, the next slide, what we're going to go over today. So we'll do our usual quick overview of core investments, what it is, and then do what we're calling a guided tour of these core tools. And so each, we'll spend about 15, 20 minutes on each tool. Um, we encourage you to try it, try it out as we're giving the tour. We'll be sharing the links to all of these tools that live in DataShare Santa Cruz County, so all of them are online. Um, so we encourage you to try them out as we're doing this tour of the tools so that you can identify any questions that might come up for you or, or we can uh, point you in the right direction if there's anything that you're still trying to figure out how, to, how exactly do these work and how do you use them. And then we'll make sure we have time at the end to address any lingering questions. And then we'll talk about closing and next steps in terms of what other training and TA is available. Just really quickly, we always like to start off our trainings and, and more in-depth conversations, asking everyone to agree to a set of uh, agreements about how we'll make this a brave and inclusive learning space. We do know that some of you are coming with some knowledge, others, this may be brand new. Um, and so we wanna make sure that everyone feels like they can ask the questions they have, share their ideas as well. And so we just ask everyone to share the responsibility to share the air. So just being aware of how much time and space you take up talking, sharing things in the chat. We definitely want participation and also wanna make sure everyone has a chance to be heard and have their questions addressed. We invite you to lean into discomfort and take risks. So we recognize that we'll be sharing a lot of information with you today. Some of you may be able to process it really quickly and be like, yep, good to go. Others may feel like, wow, that was way too fast, way too much information. I don't really understand these tools. I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like this core RFP. So just notice those reactions and just know that there is a lot of training and technical assistance and support available to help you figure out how to make the best use of these tools. So hope that you stay in that learning, learning mode today. 
Um, speak from your own experience. So if you've used the tools before, definitely would love to hear your experiences with them, um, good or bad. If you know, um, if you you know have used a tool and it's been not super easy to use, um, please share that experience and also um, know that others have found them really useful. And so we're trying to again uh, spread spread the knowledge here. We uh, encourage everyone to listen fully, be present. We actually would love it if people turned on their cameras. Uh, thanks, Serge. I see your lovely face this morning. It uh, helps us feel like we're talking to humans and that we're building a sense of a learning community here today. I encourage you to be curious. Again, stay in that learning mindset. Call each other into the learning process versus calling out. And um, we always like to remind ourselves and, and encourage others to separate the intent of someone's words or actions from the impact it may have. That's just a, a good reminder to be mindful of what we say and how we say it. And to honor confidentiality. So some of you might ask questions or share some details about the core applications you're working on um, because you're trying to figure out how these tools might help you with those applications. If you hear others, well, first I'll say, just remember, excuse me, because we're recording this, it's really up to you to decide whether and how much you wanna share about your specific um, proposals or ideas on this call. And then if you hear others sharing ideas, um, just remember to keep it in this room or, or um, that it's not our stories to tell uh, without someone else's permission. And then last but not least, to practice self-care. So we are um, spending a good chunk of time together today. We will build in a break, but also if you need to do anything to take care of yourselves, uh, stand, stretch, you know, get something to, to drink or eat during the training, we totally understand. Nicole, would you like to do a little self-care and, and cough and let me do a slide or two for you? Sure, sure. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Sure. So we often have an overview of core investments for those who might be less familiar, and some of you could probably give this part of our presentation at this point, but we do want to um, not assume that everyone knows all of this. And as we mentioned earlier, core stands for the collective of results and evidence-based investments, and it is both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for everyone in our county across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. CORE is built on this mission and vision that you see on this slide with equity at the center. And these are all of these statements, the, um, the description of CORE, the mission, the vision, the core conditions I'm, I'm about to go over are all the product of a lot of input from people like yourselves. And some of you may have participated in the CORE conversations and, um, and the, the feedback and vetting opportunities that for all of these materials, as well as the tools that we're going over today. So we really feel that this reflects a lot of, of input from our community, um, as well as the vision that guides CORE as well. When we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and outcomes aren't predictable for better or worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. And equity is at the center of this diagram and at the center of so much of CORE to illustrate that we do still have to acknowledge existing inequities and take explicit actions to create equitable opportunities and outcomes in all of these core conditions and across the set of them. And those dotted lines are really important because they're, they're showing the connections across these. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the results menu, and you'll see a lot of this language reflected in the core RFP. The specific language about equity in the core RFP starts on page two, and it really tries to emphasize that equity is both a process and a desir desired result or an impact. 
So CORE addresses anti-racism and racial equity explicitly, but not exclusively. And it's up to applicants to define the equity dimensions, such as race, ethnicity, age, or gender, and, and the inequities that they see and plan to address in their proposed projects. So this, um, this training, as well as the other uh, training and TA events, sorry, my slides are not, there we go, matching our, our uh, commentary here. So this training and technical assistance and the other uh, group sessions and individual one-on-one -on -one TA are all part of the core Institute for Innovation and Impact. And that is the, um, the container for all of this, this training and technical assistance and other learning opportunities. For those of you working in nonprofits, in, the, in public sector agencies, in grassroots groups, and we've even had some participation from the business community, which we hope to build on as well. And all of this is designed to help share knowledge, skills, and build the systems that we all need to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. At the end of today's training, we'll share more information about how you can sign up for some of these training opportunities, um, how, to, how to get scheduled for one-on-one -on -one TA, and what else is coming up um, as in, in the lineup for training and TA opportunities. But for now, we will um, go ahead and move into this tour of tools. So I'll turn it back over to Nicole. And Gisela will put um, the, the email address um, where you can send questions to the county about the RFP, as well as uh, a link to the HSD website that has a list of all the trainings as well. So many ways to connect to all of that. So back to you, Nicole. Great, thank you. And can you go ahead and switch over to the, your web browser? So the first tool we'll take a look at is the core results menu. And this is organized in a way that um, shows some community impact statements, and then you can find related community level data or indicators by core condition. So DataShare itself is an online data platform that has all kinds of data for Santa Cruz County. Um, in a moment, we can show you different ways to, to find data uh, on the platform itself. But if you're wanting to see, okay, what, because in your core applications, there will be a question where you have to identify a primary core condition that your program or service addresses. So this is uh, one way to think about that. You can look at this core results menu here on DataShare. And within each core condition, you'll see a set of what we're calling impact statements. So some of them have uh, more bullet points or impact statements than others. So you can see under health and wellness, there are four impact statements listed. Lifelong learning and education, I think is the one that has the most, it has five and then others like thriving families and community connectedness, you see have fewer, just have three. And so again, the menu itself, the names of these core conditions, the impact statements, what indicators should be grouped together under each community impact statement. Those are all things that Nicole and I worked on in collaboration with many uh, people in the community, many people from nonprofits and public agencies. So again, it's uh, represents a lot of good thinking to create and vet this menu. So let me give you one example of how to use this. Let's say that your program or project that you're applying for, let's say you feel like, okay, uh, yeah, I think health and wellness is the, is the core condition it relates to. And maybe your program or service uh, is related to increasing access to affordable quality care, or you think that that's you know one of the um, ways that your program contributes to overall well-being. So if you click on that impact statement, it takes you to another page where you can see at the top the health and wellness icon. So you know that you're still in that core condition. You can see that big header then impact one. So little things that help just orient you where you, where you are in the results menu. 
and tells you, you know, about the indicators on the page, giving you a general sense of how Santa Cruz County residents are doing in key areas of well-being in that core condition. So you can see on this page with these indicators, we see things like insurance coverage rates, access to a usual source of care, affordable, accessible, appropriate transportation to and from appointments. And so notice how that one doesn't have any of those little dashboards to the right of it, and it doesn't have a see more data button below it. It just says data unavailable at this time, meaning, because you'll see several of those kinds of indicators throughout the menu as you explore it. It means that that indicator, affordable, accessible, appropriate transportation, was something that was suggested in the process of creating this menu and others agreed, oh yeah, that would be, if we had that data, that would be a really important, valuable community level countywide indicator to have. But we just don't have, either there isn't, or we don't have access to an actual data source for it. So there isn't actually any data to add to, to data share at this time for that indicator. But we wanted to leave it in the menu just to remind us that that was something that was identified as an indicator of interest and of importance. So that, you know, there are several what we call data gaps like that in the core results menu that we hope will just help feed ongoing discussions about how do we continue to um, add to this menu and make it more robust. But if we look at one of the other indicators, uh, maybe if we scroll up to the insurance coverage rates, again, you can see some dashboards to the right of it that tell you at a glance. Uh, how things are looking for adults with health insurance, children, people with private insurance only, people with public health insurance only. So that's kind of a nice at a glance uh, look at where things stand in our community. If you click the see more, but see more data button under that indicator, that actually takes you to a more um, kind of a the next level down. You can start to see more um, kind of data and updates about where things stand with each particular indicator. And you can drill down even further for each specific one. So if you click on the see the data under adults with health insurance, that takes you to the actual, this is what the indicator page looks like in data share. So for each data point in data share, uh, this is what the page would look like. It tells you at the top what indicator it is. So this indicator shows the percentage of adults age 19 to 64 years that have any type of health insurance coverage. So that can be really helpful to understand exactly what you're looking at and what the data is about. There's a an explanation below that. Why is this important? Um, and each indicator has a little has a little description like that. So that can be really helpful, especially when you're if you're developing a theory of change and you're trying to find some language about uh, to describe the need or where there might be gaps or um, why particular uh, solutions might be relevant or important. You might find some language on data share in you know by getting to going through the core results menu to get to an indicator. In that why is this important section, you might find some helpful language there to include as you're trying to make your case. You continue scrolling down, then you'll see the actual data. And so here we can see that it's showing us a chart for Santa Cruz County as a whole. 92% of adults ages 19 to 64 have any, any kind of health insurance. Over on the left side, you'll see uh, every indicator will tell you the original data source. So in this case, it's the American Community Survey. And that the last measurement period was from 2019. And you'll see in some cases, some of the data will look relatively old. <laughs> like, like even this data is a couple years old. Uh, some of the indicators, the original data source may not have been collected. Uh, in the last, you know, two, three, even five years. So you'll, so it's important to look at the measurement period to understand how current it is. Sometimes depending on, again, the original data source, that might be the last time that was collected. And so when you see maintained by, 
And here it says Conduit Healthy Communities Institute. That's the company, the organization that runs this platform. Um, they are the ones that are responsible for maintaining and making sure that as soon as current data is released from the American Community Survey related to this indicator, that it gets updated and added to data share. And then you can see when it was last updated, it was December 2020. So we can be, you know, probably reasonably assured that this is the most current data available. There might be an update, you know, coming sometime soon. Um, but it's it's the last update, you know, it, it wasn't like it was years ago. And so we can probably be pretty sure it's the most recent data. Then you can see, and this will this will vary depending on the actual indicator and again, how the original data source collected the data. But here we can see that we can look at the data, the indicator values, we can look at the change over time. So we can tell us whether trends are changing. So you can see from um, 2017 to 2019, there's been a slight, just a slight decrease. It looks, the, the line makes it look like it's a larger decrease, but it's um, you know, 0.75% decrease between 2017 and 2019. But that can be helpful to get a, a sense of what is that trend over time. And then again, some, but not all indicators you can view by subgroups. So oftentimes we call this disaggregating data. So in this case, health insurance for adults, we can actually view it by age, by age bracket, by gender. So if Nicole clicks on the gender box and scrolls down, then you see another chart added that shows you the data for female versus male versus overall. And then this is one that has the data also available by race and ethnicity. So if you click on that, it shows another bar and will also tell you based on the color of the bar, whether the value um, of that data is significantly better than the overall value or if it's significantly worse for the overall value for that particular subgroup. So lots of good information. Again, depending on the original data source, that, that level of breakdown may or may not be available. Um, and so you just always look on that left-hand side of that, you know, to the left-hand side of the chart to see what breakdowns are available. Some data is also available uh, only by county. So countywide data might be the only geographic level that's available. In this example, um, for adults with health insurance, it's also available by census place. So if you wanted to get more granular with your data, especially if you are, again, in your core applications, if you are describing some data, citing some data as a way to make your case about a particular need, um, it can be really helpful when it is available by census place. And here, I think, are we, I don't see a map, Nicole, so I'm thinking maybe then that would have to, this is one that would have to be downloaded um, as a CSV or Excel file. Sometimes the, when you click on census place, it'll open up or then display a map where you can actually see graphically uh, what the data looks like. So that's an example of the core results menu and how you go from core condition to an impact statement to then exploring specific indicators further. Each indicator, Nicole is uh, con continuing to scroll down. Go ahead and keep scrolling down because there was some good information there at the bottom. You'll also see for any indicator, it also shows you related indicators. So Maybe you realize, oh, this isn't, this isn't exactly what I wanted. Uh, what else is available kind of in that same family or same category of, of indicators? We'll talk about this tool later this morning, the Promising Practices Database. But basically, for that specific indicator, if you are interested in seeing, well, what other programs, practices have others done to try to uh, create changes or improvements related to that particular indicator? That Promising Practices database is a handy tool to, to look up some of that. And then you can see other types of resources available on data share, uh, funding opportunities, reports, data resources. We're not going to dive into those today, but just wanted to give you a general sense of the core results menu on data share and how to get around in it. 
So I think at this point, I'm going to pause. We wanted to give you all a chance to try it out yourself. And so um, that link that Gisela put in the chat is one way to get to it. And so if you wanted to click on that link now, open up your own browser page, you might even want to bookmark it so that it's there. You can go straight to it when you need it. But as Nicole is showing us, another way to get to it is if you go to datashareSCC.org and hover your mouse over the local prog progress tile or, or menu bar, it shows you then a submenu. You want to um, hover over local progress pages and then core results menu. So there's a few steps to get to it that way. You could also just do a Google search core results menu, data share, and that will be the first thing that pops up. And Stacy, I see, is asking, is there a way to search for all data available by census place rather than one indicator at a time? Um, the, if, you're, if you can follow what Nicole is showing with her mouse, one nice way, one easy way to even know like what is available by census place is to go to the data tab, view data, and then choose indicators by location level. And that will tell you, because not every indicator is available by census place or by zip code. So this is a handy list to be able to see what is available at that geographic level. And so then you can, if you see one that you're interested in, you can click on the actual name of the indicator to get to that page. You could, I believe, create a your own customized dashboard where you could then have, if you were only interested in all the indicators from a certain census place, um, I believe you can do that. That I think is probably um, a little bit more than we'll have time to cover today. Did that help, Stacy? And there's on on data share itself. Maybe Nicole, if you can go to the home page. There, you'll see some quick links that are nice, you know, little tutorials, how to build a custom dashboard, which is what you would, and how to create a, a curated report. So those are some resources that you might want to look to if you want to create your own dashboard, an easy, you know, curated list of just the indicators you're interested in. So we wanted to give you a chance to try out the course results menu, see if you can find something that you're interested in that might be relevant to your application. And um, so we'll give you maybe like a minute to, to play around, to explore, and then we'll see if anyone wants to share what they found. And would anyone like to talk us through, starting with a core condition that you were interested in and an impact statement that you chose? Tell us what you found and if any of the indicators there were useful to you. Yeah, David, go ahead. All right, I'll start the ball rolling here. So. Um, because, and we're still strategizing about how we put our different programs, our six programs into which size applications and combine or not combine, but um, it, it seems between health and wellness and thriving families, um, they are, uh, you know, when we look at optimal health status and resilience, that they, that they fall probably in both of those. 
So I assume we can pick one again and reference the other. Uh, so when we cite the needs, we can talk about both in a sense with one being the effective primary and the other kind of a secondary one. Does that make sense? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the question on the core application where it asks you to select a primary core condition, that's mostly for the purposes of the county and city being able to have some way to categorize the applications that come in. It's, it's not gonna have anything to do with scoring. Um, and so, yeah, so definitely recommend like pick whatever core condition feels like it makes the most sense to name as your primary. And then yes, wherever you can, there might, and there might be multiple questions, right? Where you feel like, oh, it'd be good to mention the interconnectedness of these core conditions. And by doing this one thing, it is um, addressing or contributing to outcomes in more than one core condition. I would, I would definitely mention that wherever, wherever you can. Or wherever so they're not really sense. going to separate panels, kind of like they did last time, depending upon the chosen primary core condition. There's a different sort of global scoring process going on. Is that I would say yes, and and um, and also it's still unknown. <laughs> okay. So it is different from last time, where last time it was clearly like there was a panel for health, there was a panel for homelessness, there was a panel. So it won't be uh, at this point. That's not the plan for how they'll be constructed. It'll be more by the grant tier size, okay, and multidisciplinary panels. It's possible though once. The county and cities actually see what applications come in for what there might need to be maybe a, a you know next level of um thinking about how to organize the panels just so you know three panels don't get like 20 applications to review <laughs> right okay well um, i would hope it's a, a little more global again so that that choice doesn't dictate you you might end right. up in the wrong place with the wrong people so that's just right. my suggestion yeah. okay. all right thanks And so, David, did you feel like um, when you started going through the results menu, did you find any particular indicators that you felt would be useful or relevant to your application um, or just in general? Some did not have indicators present. And, you know, I, I think any of us with the resources we have are, we can cite an indicator, in, you know, that shows need. But to move the bar on it, obviously, we're not going to step forward for that assignment because, we, you know, we do what we can with what we have and hope that we move the bar. But obviously, you know, um, our indicators of success relate more to the, you know, the client feedback and, and scales that we employ evaluation loop than it does we're going to reduce this by 10% in the community. Obviously, that's not going to happen from one application. So I found some that related to uh, probably under health and some under thriving families that lack data. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so I'm glad you raised that point. So the idea behind citing or using community level indicators in your proposal is mostly to convey the need, right, as part of your need statement or problem statement. Um, it's kind of a different response, right? To say what your program outcomes will be. So we'll get to that tool in terms of um, what might what might help with that. Um, the targeted impact grants though, if anybody on here is considering applying for one of the targeted impact grants, that is one where um, there probably needs to be a stronger connection or a really clear connection between what you're proposing and how um, by you know, adopting a collective impact approach, how you hope to, again, not solely be responsible for moving the needle on that community indicator, but to be able to make a strong case that what you would be doing collectively would definitely be contributing to that change. Okay, any other questions, feedback about the core results menu in your little practice right now? Okay, then I'm gonna turn it back over to Nicole for the next tool. Thanks, Nicole. Let me share my screen again. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the strategies and outcomes uh, tool that's located on DataShare, and you can get to it from the core results menu in a couple of different ways that I'll go over. So bear with me here. Hopefully my Wi-Fi will cooperate. So here we are back in the core results menu that we were just on when Nicole was describing how to drill down on some of these indicators. And now um, you can either see a link here in some of this introductory uh, paragraph before the results menu has a link to this and to a couple other tools that we're talking about today, the Promising Practices database and the core continuum of results and evidence. But there's also a much more easy to see orange button at the bottom of any core results menu page. And so I'm gonna click on that one just to show you. And this is the page that shows the links between strategies and program outcomes. We think of strategies as approaches or, or the sort of collection of, um, of activities that, that you might propose to address a particular community level impact or core condition, or as, as David was describing, not necessarily solving it, but contributing it to addressing it. So these tools are not designed to be prescriptive um, you don't have to choose something from these menus if they're not designed to be exhaustive. They're just designed to be helpful if you would like to find some ways to phrase some of these um, activities and strategies and outcomes. This might be a good place to start. It might be a way that you can organize your ideas. Um, it's not a place to say this is, there's a right way or a wrong way to do this. It's really meant to stimulate your thinking. Um, if, if that would be helpful to you. And it's also a way to build some common language for all of us and how we talk about some of these things, about strategies and outcomes and goals and impacts. And so if you are at, at the point in your project where you're developing your ideas, maybe through a theory of change or a logic model, doing some program planning and evaluation, um, applying for funding through the core RFP or other funding sources, this might be a place to start or to refine what you already have. And just a, a plug for the uh, recordings of the theory of change and logic model training that some of you have attended, but those are available on our YouTube channel as recordings in both English and Spanish. So as I mentioned, we've got the, the strategies in the first part of this, um, describing the, the different approaches that you might take. So the, the bundle or categories of activities that are leading to the program outcomes that you want to achieve. And those in turn contribute to the community impacts. So there, there are a bunch of steps that lead to those impacts. And so the, this uh, lays out the connections across them without saying that you and your program are delivering those, those uh, community level impacts. And the strategies answer the question, where are you focusing your efforts? with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So in this menu, you can see that we have tried to help answer that question of where you're focusing your efforts by categorizing them as people, organizations and systems, places and communities, or public and political will, where some of the advocacy kinds of strategies might fall. So I'll just click on people to show you the detail. Each of these plus signs opens up another menu. And so if you're focusing on specific groups of people who might benefit from programs or policies that you're undertaking and seeking funding for, so the examples here are maybe women who are experiencing homelessness or seniors who are isolated and homebound, or immigrants who don't have their documentation um, or are living in mixed status families that complicates things like um, seeking uh, eligibility for different kinds of services. So these boxes that, that are under the people category and strategies have just some examples that, that are the kinds of things that could be implemented if you were doing, for example, outreach, education and engagement to, to draw people to services, or if you were trying to identify issues so you could intervene earlier in a, in a prevention sort of time frame. Um, maybe you're trying to be responsive and, and intervene in a different way. 
Um, maybe you're just trying to maintain some progress that has already been achieved. And you may find that the activities that you're doing do fit under here, under people, but maybe they're also about organizations and systems. So this, these are really just different ways to slice and dice the kinds of strategies that a program might employ to achieve its outcomes. Um, so if, if, you're, if you feel like you're doing something that involves people, but it fits into this category, um, great. This is really just examples, um, what kinds of strategies people might employ. So for example, you might be um, using a training and technical assistance approach as we are in the core institute. You might be part of a collaborative that's looking to knit together different organizations, the efforts across a particular sector or between sectors. Maybe you're sharing data like DataShare tries to do. So many examples here. And the same is true for places and communities where there might be um, social capital kinds of things to build trust um, through, through these kinds of activities. There might be some community-wide um, work going on, investments in infrastructure. So you get the idea. So, and, and in this one, uh, community organizing and power building is, is both a place and community strategy, but it might also be a strategy that happens in the public and political will collection of different kinds of strategies. So these might be things where you're looking specifically at a policy that is uh, affecting larger uh, groups of people and um, as opposed to things that are more one-on-one -on -one individual services. But a lot of things could fit in multiple categories as you can see. And again, just emphasizing that None of these is better than another. It's just a question of what fits with your resources and your goals and just trying to choose a focus so that you can describe and articulate it for grant reviewers, for funders, for your board members, for um, onboarding new, new employees, what, whatever your need is to really have um, a cohesive sense of what you're doing and why this is a great place to, to refine that that communications work and thinking work. The next part of this, um, this menu has program outcomes. And these are getting into the more measurable changes that, that you hope to achieve. And this is answering that question of, is anyone better off as a result of our efforts? And these program outcomes are further subdivided into short-term ones that might happen, you, you decide, but usually within a year or a little more than that, but, but some period of months, as opposed to intermediate outcomes that are probably further away in time and harder to achieve. So those might take multiple years, for example. So under short-term outcomes, we have the types of changes that might be um, changes in awareness. So maybe people are more aware of something that, uh, that, that will lead to change further down the line. Maybe they need uh, knowledge in order to access something, a service, or, or um, they need to change their attitude or belief about something or their skills. So one example might be, for example, during COVID, a lot of healthcare uh, switched very quickly to telehealth, uh, tele telemedicine for uh, avoiding being in-person contact during, during uh, the pandemic. That was in much greater use, more broadly used, um, but it wasn't for everyone. And there were some hurdles to overcome in terms of people's comfort level with that. There were some infrastructure sorts of things in terms of broadband access or using a tablet. Um, so there were knowledge, attitude, and skills changes that were required before people could even use that as a way to access their, um, have greater access to care. In the intermediate outcomes, then we're looking at things that build on those changes in uh, knowledge, in skills, in attitudes, in awareness. Once those things have been achieved, what happens next? And so further down the line, we might have changes in status um, that are the result of a change in behavior. But we all know at this time of New Year's resolutions that behaviors don't change quickly. Um, so 
we need to do the groundwork of the awareness, knowledge, skills, and attitudes to get to this point. But once that happens, we start to see different levels of change. So in my telehealth example, after people have gain some knowledge about how to how to access that tool. Maybe they have a, a different skill level and how to use a tablet. Um, then they're actually accessing care. And if their access improves, then maybe there'll be a change in their health status. So for example, people who couldn't um, access mental health counseling before because of their job schedule or transportation hurdles suddenly have access to that. And maybe over time that will lead to a different uh, change in their health status, um, their sense of well-being as reported on different surveys or other metrics. So again, these all move in tandem, but it's up to you to decide what your short-term and longer-term outcomes are, how they build off each other, how they um, employ different kinds of strategies, and these are just suggestions to help organize some of that thinking and conversation, both for your core RFP applications and for other uses as well. So we hope that you'll find this helpful, but it's, it's not required in any way and it's, it's not um, intended to be prescriptive. So any questions at this point? It's a great tool, you guys. Super grateful for it. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. We um, we often find that even when we have ideas, when we're working on our own um, grant materials, for example, we often will have an idea about something that's just hard to formulate. And, and things like this really help prompt more specific thinking for us. So we hope it's it's useful for you as well. Nicole, anything to add? No, uh, not really. And this might be obvious just in looking to everyone, just in looking at it. But, um, you know, we tried to include, you know, in terms of all those bullet points, just different examples of ways to phrase program outcome statements. Um, you know, that sometimes what you're trying to convey is that the program or service you're implementing or proposing will result in some kind of increase in an attitude of belief, for example, like maybe an increased level of confidence or increased willingness to do something <laughs> um, among a certain population, whatever you know, population you're working with. Sometimes your outcome might be phrased as, you know, that you're going to decrease the instance of something happening. Or sometimes it's helpful to phrase it as that X percent of the population you're working with will demonstrate whatever change it is you're looking for. So just different ways. And, and again, depending on what it is that you're proposing or implementing, what you measure or how you've been measuring it. Uh, sometimes it, you know, different phrasing the outcomes in different ways uh, tends to feel more natural in some situations versus others. So we were trying to just, just give several different options or ideas. Basically, like, treat these like templates that you can then take mm -hmm. and customize. And so these are kind of like outcomes, mad libs. You can fill in some of the blanks. Um, but also, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in subsequent trainings as well. So sometimes you do or do not have access to data that will help you fill in these blanks. So you also may want to match it to what you think you can learn and how you can learn it, what resources you have to learn those things. So all of that comes into play. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, um, we are right on schedule to take a 10 minute screen break um, or recaffeination break or whatever you need. So we'll do that and come back at, let's see, four after the hour and we'll see you then. And if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to pop them in the, 
into the chat. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the core continuum of results and evidence, which is another tool that you can find um, on DataShare. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. OK, let's start up again. So now we're moving on to the third tool, which is the core continuum of results and evidence. And before we actually take a look at it, I'll just give a little bit of context about this particular tool. Those of you that were around in the original round of core funding, that request for proposals, you'll remember that one of the big kind of new concepts or uh, areas of focus that was introduced at that time was evidence-based programs and practices, that there was a very explicit intent on the county and city's part to fund evidence-based programs and practices. And in the original RFP and, and the one that was administered you know, five years ago, there were different levels of evidence-based programs and practices that were defined. You know, the kind of top level was the type of traditional evidence-based programs or EBPs that we often think of that have been heavily researched, you know, using randomized control trials or very, you know, scientific methods published in, you know, peer review journals, could be found on a clearinghouse. So there were some criteria about what was considered an evidence-based program or practice, what was considered, uh, I think it was an effective practice and that what, what was innovative. I think they had names like that. But basically the last time the tiers did allow for the possibility that there could be programs that have been evaluated, but just not at a scientific level or innovative programs that have um, kind of a, a light evaluation that had been done. So there was that flexibility in the last round of core funding, but it also did raise a lot of questions or concerns that, that there might be a preference towards the traditional EVPs or that the county and city would give more weight or a higher score um, for those types of programs. That turned out to not be the case. That's not how funding uh, was allocated. But because of the kinds of questions that came up, this is one of the areas that Nicole and I have worked on over the last few years, again, with, with you know input and feedback from many people, to just come up with a more nuanced way of thinking about evidence and results and data. And so to find this tool, we're going to go back to the core results menu. And you can find it on the landing page. It's called the Core Continuum of Results and Evidence. And so it's a it's a, in DataShare as a PDF. Can everyone see that OK? Thank you. And so we took the idea of like of having tiers that were kind of stacked <laughs> vertically and are thinking about more of a spectrum or a continuum that has some points on it. And the, and the idea is that any particular program or practice could fall anywhere on that, on that continuum based on some general characteristics. You might be doing some things in your agency that would be considered a good idea because you've been informally evaluating it. You might be doing other things that have more evaluation or data behind it that would be considered an effective practice or even an evidence-based practice. And what we're trying to do, to do with this continuum is first convey these points on the continuum don't come with uh, an inherent value to them. It's not like evidence-based is somehow more valuable than emerging because we actually think that every evidence-based program practice that has been researched started off somewhere in someone's head is a good idea <laughs> or an emerging practice. And so it's more about thinking about where you might fall in that continuum, whether and how you might wanna to move to a different place in that continuum, and what data would you need to be able to move on that continuum. So we've come up with some working definitions. That's what that first row is under each of those names of the points in the continuum. So we, for emerging, uh, practice, we have, as our working definition, a program, practice, or policy that has not been evaluated yet, 
but anecdotal feedback is positive. So maybe you're just really kind of in that experimental mindset. You're like, hey, we think this might be useful. We're not really sure. Before we too, put too much time or resources into it, let's try it out and just get some informal feedback about it. And, and then we'll go from there. So that's um, what we might think of as emerging. Let's say then um, you are thinking, well, that, that we're getting some good initial feedback. Let's do some really light evaluation, some informal evaluation, just to see, is this really a good idea, like our, our category says. So think of a good idea as a program, practice, or policy that's been informally evaluated and shows early signs of progress towards improving at least one outcome. So this is, you know, um, maybe you're doing some feedback surveys, Maybe you're still doing some, you know, gathering some anecdotal feedback. Uh, you might be tracking uh, primarily like the the outputs, like how much, you know, how much did you do? How many people participated? What is their general feedback um, that tells you whether it's a good idea or not, or if it needs to be adjusted? Let's say that you are informally evaluating something that is a good idea and you decide, you know what, that's good and good enough for us. We're happy <laughs> to stay at this point on the continuum. We'll just keep doing this informal evaluation. That is completely okay. But then let's say you, you realize, oh, okay, this good idea could turn into something. And so, but we need to gather some more data, put a little bit more structure to the evaluation uh, because we might want to go out and seek additional funding for it or bring in other partners and they're going to be interested in uh, more concrete data and results. So we're defining effective practice on the, on this continuum as a program, practice, or policy that's been in, that has been formally evaluated in a more structured way and demonstrated at least one positive outcome. And the results may or may not be statistically significant. Like you've seen a positive change, you know, the desired direction that you're hoping for, but it doesn't necessarily have to meet, you know, that threshold of, you know, you ran some kind of statistical test and it was significant. And it tells you that it wasn't just chance or luck that you got that positive outcome. So again, you might be doing something that because of past evaluations or other models that you're replicating where they've done formal evaluations, you might decide, oh, what we're doing or what we're proposing fits that description of effective practice, and we're good with that. We are fine with being on that point on the continuum. We're, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. So that's totally fine. Other cases, you might decide, well, we want to not only do something that's been evaluated formally, but really we, we are interested in, or maybe another funder actually is requiring uh, you to implement an evidence-based program or practice that fits more of that traditional definition, that it has been rigorously studied uh, one or more times, usually with a comparison group that's part of that scientific, you know, experimental design to really be able to show that the impacts, the outcomes that came out of it were due to that intervention, that program versus, you know, again, luck or chance or other factors. Um, and that, again, those research studies, either that you've done or that have been done by others in the field, that they've demonstrated statistically significant improvements in at least one outcome. So each time it's, it is adding kind of a, a, a layer of rigor, of depth of information, what it tells you, um, but again, not implying that one is better than the other. Again, what we're showing here are examples of the types of data or evidence that might be gathered that um, helps you figure out where to place a program or practice on this continuum. Again, think of these as examples. We often use the phrases like menu or continuum to imply that you know there are choices. So this isn't necessarily like, oh, to be considered an effective practice, you have to gather data in all the ways that are listed here. Um, you might just pick one or two, or, or even just one. If you scroll back up a little bit, Nicole, I'll point out that we have, um, in the last couple months, made a couple modifications to this tool. It originally looked a little bit different, 
but we made some modifications in our working definitions and the names we're using for the points on the continuum. So that it lines up with the promising practices database that Nicole will, will review next. Um, so that our definitions kind of match the definitions that promising practices uses. Um, the, only, the main difference is that there isn't a category called emerging on the promising practices database, um, but there are ways that if there's something that locally is being implemented that kind of fits that description of emerging, there are ways to request or suggest that it be added to the promising practices database. And Nicole will go over that later. So that's one way to think about the core results menu. Again, in the core application, there I believe there's a question in each of the tiers. We have to, I, to name at least one or more programs or practices that you're proposing to implement. And where does that particular program or practice fall in the continuum? So this is a tool that you would look to to help you answer that. But then even after you've figured out where you think your program or practice falls in this continuum, there are other ways to use this tool on an ongoing basis. Um, the first two rows that are showing in this next page of the tool, degree of formality and structure in collecting and reporting the evidence and documentation that can be found in the public realm, those are really just additional ways to, if you're trying to figure out, wait, is this a good idea or is it effective? Is it effective or evidence-based? And you're trying to you know, see where you best fit. Those might just be some other ways to um, think about or things to look for that might help you decide that. But again, it's not a hard and fast rule. But what we think is actually uh, one of, going to be one of the, or is one of the mo more useful parts of this tool is the last two rows in this page of the continuum, these sets of questions that you might be asking or saying to yourself as you plan or design programs, practices, and policies, and then questions you might ask yourself about the results and evidence or data that you're gathering. And so in that green row about what you might be asking or saying as you're doing program planning and evaluation planning, the questions are slightly different or they kind of build on each other as you move along that continuum. So if you're in the emerging point on the continuum, you might find yourself asking or saying things like, you know, the, the usual approaches aren't solving the issue. And so I wonder what would happen if we tried this new idea um, and what can we try that hasn't been, tr hasn't been done before. So again, it's very much kind of that experimental mindset and set of questions. If you're on that good idea point on the continuum, you might be asking or saying things like, well, this approach seems to be reaching the right number and types of people and the informal feedback we're getting makes it seem like it's worth doing. But how do or how will we actually know? Um, how do we know that's more than just those initial four or five people that we, that we tried this out with that feel this way? Um, what data do we need to help convey the importance of this approach? So again, it's kind of like these questions are food for thought for each point of the continuum. Whereas an effective, the effective point in the continuum, you might be saying to yourself, this approach seems to work. The program practice or policy that was evaluated improved the same or similar outcome or outcomes in our logic model. So you're looking for, you know, does it align there? And then again, you might be asking, but how do we really know? Like, do we need more data? What kind of data do we need to really convey why this approach works and for whom? And then finally, on the evidence-based point on the continuum, again, you might find you're saying, yourself saying or asking things like, you know, research shows that this works. It's improved, again, same or similar outcomes that we're interested in in our logic model, but how will we know if it works in this setting, in our community, or with this different population? And what data, again, will you need to help convey why that approach works, for whom it will work, in what conditions? And then let's say that you've been gathering that data and you're trying to think about where, what to do with it or where to go from there. Once you have your own results and evidence or data at each point in the continuum. So the questions on the emerging side about things like, should we keep doing this? Should we do more of it? And if so, how much more? And again, what other data or evidence should be collected? And then on the other end of the continuum, the evidence-based, the types of questions you might ask yourself once you've gathered some results and evidence might be, you know, do you feel like you have enough 
of these kinds of research studies with done with an equity lens to justify the assertion of the statement that this particular approach, this particular intervention works. If you're adopting something that was researched in another setting or community, you know, are you likely to get or did you get comparable results, given that, you know, we may have a different context in our local community? And again, what other data or evidence might be needed? And so again, there's no right or wrong answers to those questions. Uh, we like to think of it as these are questions to get in the habit of asking. So build, really build that muscle to be asking and answering these, you know, with colleagues, with partners. Uh, it really helps make uh, meaning of any data or programs and practices that have been evaluated versus feeling like it's an either or, yes, it's evidence-based or not, or not. Yes, I would get funding for this <laughs> or not. So really, um, really thinking about it and approaching it in a more nuanced way. So I will pause there and see if there are any questions about the core continuum of results and evidence in general, or about how it might be a useful tool as you're preparing your core applications. Sure. Was that a, uh, did I hear someone start to yeah, say something? I'll Sure, I'll say something. I, I, I saw, I think, a comment from Stacy saying, I find the tool overwhelming. Well, you're, yes, <laughs> it is. But um, I think um, you know, there's been little invest, I mean, there's tremendous investment in structuring all this, but the reality of data collection at, at the program level within agencies, you know, varies dramatically and our ability and resources to do that. And even the kinds of services and clients we have, there are some you can't gather hardly any data on, and I'll say, let's say callers to a suicide line uh, or residents of care facilities. Um, so even though we went through a, a lengthy process last time and developed very specific evaluation tools and have tracked those for five years, and I think we can probably do the musical chairs to fit in, you know, under this. Um, I think it might be daunting for people to try to gather some of this information uh, because there was never a serious investment at the agency or program level. When you're doing flat funding, let's say, for a period of time just to provide the services, your ability to invest additional resources in data collection and um, uh, reports is limited. So even though I feel like, you know, we're going to be able to do this, I think it, it might, other people either, whether they're new and haven't done much of this in the past or have challenging client and target populations that may not be able to offer a lot of the data. Just a thought. Yeah, and, you know, I think part of, um, and I'd be interested to in hearing Stacy more your thoughts about what what uh, about it feels overwhelming. Um, you know, I think with with all of these tools, they've been designed to recognize that different agencies, different programs, um, are in all different developmental places. Right? There are some that really are interested in and ready to implements the more traditional evidence-based programs and practices, um, but really want to, you know, want guidance or tools or help thinking through, okay, how do we go about doing that? How do we convey that that's what we're doing? What do we need to do to prepare for that? So if that's something that an agency is interested in, right, that they might just focus only on that column, right, that point on the continuum for evidence-based and use that as a way to think through you know, how ready are we? How do we really convey the results that we're getting? If that if that's not applicable to a program or agency and they don't have the capacity to try to get there on the continuum, that I think that's the that's the main point of this continuum is say there's no expectation or um, message being implied that you have to move along the continuum. It's more like 
really looking at, okay, what data do we have? And is that, does that help us tell our story in the way that we really want to be able to, or do we need to be looking at collecting something else or collecting in a different way? And if so, how might we go about doing that? Um, and for the, you know, for the funder side, for the county and city, it helps them better understand, right, where different uh, organizations and programs are in their data collection capacity. And if a, an applicant recognizes or realizes by using this tool, well, you know, we're, we want to be, or we think we're at, a, at the good idea point, but it, we're not even really sure how to collect kind of some of the basic, you know, participation numbers or, um, you know, just even some of the basic demographic information, that that could be an opportunity, right, to build in some time and resources into your core application to build out that process or use these core TA sessions to help think through, like, how, you know, how do you build that capacity and what are some simple and feasible ways to collect that data that would be, you know, meaningful and, again, feasible. So um, certainly here that, yeah, that's what we mean, but sometimes... You know, in a 15-minute tour of a tool, it can, it can definitely feel overwhelming and also really encourage you to, like, take what of it feels useful and relevant and make it yours. So, Stacy, I see your hand up and Serge. So, how about Stacy first, since you also post something in the chat and then Serge? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it's a great tool. I'm, I need to spend time unpacking it. Um, I think my question really is, I need some clarification that what we're stating in the application is not where our program is on the continuum, but where the program we're adopting, or like I'm doing the research and saying like, they have a good practice and I see the results of that and we wanna do that. Or, because I'm working on five of these, um, we have a model and we're now moving to the next level with it. Like we're expanding grade levels or we're growing beyond our little community, but we see the success. And so we haven't gone to that population yet, but we see success here. So I, I think that's where I need some clarification. If it's new or expanding and we haven't evaluated it yet internally, but we're using something that has been evaluated or somewhere on that continuum, is that what we're saying? Or are we supposed to be reporting where we are on that continuum? Yeah, so it might be, let's see if I can, um, I think I followed that. Let me see if I can answer, because I think there's probably a couple, it depends kind of answers. <laughs> and so uh, tell me if this makes sense or, or gets to your question. So if you are proposing to implement a program or practice where it's new for your agency that you're working with, it's new to them, but they're implementing something that is either an exact replication or it's based on another program or practice that has been evaluated, has been researched, um, and you're going to implement it like the same way that they've designed it, so basically you're replicating something, then I think my suggestion was you know, call it what what that research thing is or whatever, wherever that program or practice falls that someone else did and use the tool to think through, okay, did they evaluate it? Like, how did they evaluate? What kinds of outcomes did they get? Versus was it researched, you know, in a more rigorous study? Um, and then use that tool to help you kind of decide what you want to call it, you know, where on the on the continuum. And then in your narrative responses, you'll describe this will be a new program or practice we're implementing. We're adopting XYZ program. We'll implement it the way it's been designed. These are the outcomes they got when they implement it this way. We expect to, you know, uh, produce the same kinds of outcomes. So that would be one way to use it. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Just on that part. What if it's not replication of a program, but informed by best practices in the literature? I can, I can tell this is where our, we're going to spend our one-on-one -on -one session. Time. Yeah, yeah. 
I think if the literature is, that you're citing is like other evaluation studies or other, um, I, I think it'll depend like what, what literature you're citing and like, you know, was it an evaluation study? Was it a research study? How much of what the literature described, how much are you doing? I guess what I'm trying to say is like, there's a difference between like saying we're, we're, we're adopting this approach because others have found, like if the literature says it's a good thing to do, um, but we're gonna kind of create our own version of it. Um, that may um, depend on, again, what the literature is that you're citing and like what, um, again, whether it was research studies or other evaluation studies. So I- Yeah, I would, could I chime in? Yeah. I mean, if you're compiling best practices from multiple sources or studies and sort of concocting your own approach that combines them, then you're doing something new that you would wanna look at, um, but you might be, you'd be asking these kinds of questions about, you know, what, what do we wanna know about it? What can we learn from others? What, what would we expect, as Nicole said, if, if others have achieved these kinds of outcomes, then maybe these other ones are, maybe we could expect something in that direction or this adaptation is, sorry about the squeaky toys. <laughs> I thought I had removed those. <laughs> um, this adaptation, for example, in a different language or a different population um, should yield the same outcomes, but we don't know for sure. So that's one of the things we're gonna test. There, as Nicole said, it depends on, you know, on how much um, the, the, the literature on fidelity and adaptation is something to look at here. So it's how much of what you're doing has been done before and how much of it are you using as sort of a launching pad for something of your own um, creativity and devising. And, and so when you do that, you're, you're taking something that might have been towards with, with more uh, data around it and moving it into the emerging or good idea or new testing of something, some innovation. And so it just depends on how far apart those might be that, that what, what else you need to know. And this is all about what else do we need to know? What, what do we know? What else do we need to know? And so um, if you think about that as sort of a, a seesaw, you know, in some in some ways, in some places, in some programs, some set of literature, some prior evaluations um, are almost completely prepackaged. It's a curriculum, it has uh, survey instruments, it has training tools for staff. And so that's something that you would have a degree of confidence in if it's been evaluated and shown certain outcomes. On the other hand, if that's something that doesn't speak to your population, but you, you, you think it has something in it that would be interesting and useful, but not all of it, then you're really doing an adaptation to varying degrees and you're testing that assumption that it, that it works in some way. And so then you're, doing some, you're taking something that's been tested in one way or, or evaluated or known in one way, but you're making it your own, in which case you are needing to learn whether that assumption is correct, that, it, that it's something that can be adapted. So it really depends on how much you know and how much you need to know. And if I can just say one more thing before we get to Serge's question or comment, um, I think the reason why I was hesitating earlier about how to respond is without knowing exactly what you're considering and what literature, it's, it's hard to give you a super helpful response. And also, like the question about where, the question in the core application about where does your program or practice fall in the continuum? That's one of those that again is purely for information, purely descriptive. Like, um, and so it's not gonna be scored. It's not like a, there's a different score given if you're you know, effective versus good idea. So really the important part is what you describe in your narrative responses, all the things that Nicole just said. And so at, at, to a certain degree, like no one's gonna say, oh, okay, they said in this grant application, it's effective 
like is like no one's gonna be looking and say is it really effective versus a good idea like no one's gonna be judging it that way it's really looking at the um how clear how complete um your responses are about the data that you have what um what outcomes do you plan to measure why do you think this will work that's where you might cite some of the other research that has been done that that gives you the sense that even if we haven't even if you haven't implemented it locally here's why you think it'll work so it's really the i think the narrative responses where that's your chance to describe all of that Okay, Serge, thanks for being so patient. Oh, no problem. Uh, the questions are all really helpful to, to me as well. Um, so for me, as I'm playing with this tool, um, my program is a little um, outside the box for this. Um, and I have uh, sort of a day program which is recovery for mental health or substance use or whatever sort of uh, issue somebody is challenged with, um, with the idea that a com community feeling and rapport with others is the way to start healing. Um, so I like community connectedness, but that's not our, um, what I see as the, the primary thing. Our primary thing is health and wellness. So I go looking at health and wellness and I'm trying to click on these little things and they give um, indicators that are sort of helpful and some data that's sort of useful. Um, but, um, I don't, it's, it's, I'm glad like this tool pulls a lot of stuff together, but I'm definitely going to be looking for, um, data that's not here from other sources and also, um, more recent data on fentanyl and stuff like, which might've been in the last year. Um, so I was looking at the two last health and wellnesses, um, behaviors that maintain or improve health and opti optimal health because just because of those phrases I still found things that were useful in each one of these things um, and I just wanted to point something out when I went to behaviors that maintain or improve health and then I went down to the bottom which is substance use which is after the one for diabetes monitoring and when I clicked on substance use and um, I click on the first one adults who binge drink um, it actually pulls up the data on the diabetic monitoring, which was one of the prior ones. So I found my little workaround because they give a couple little links before you click on see more data for adults who binge drink. It actually shows you like compared to prior value on that page where it says adults who binge drink and adults who smoke. So I still can go to the adults who binge drink data. Um, but just saying that some of the, I think this is still a build in work and sometimes you have to click around and sometimes you find something surprising that's useful to you. Um, I was a little surprised. I, I didn't quite understand why below, um, still on behaviors that maintain or improve health substance use, it lists the ER rate for substance use age adjusted and it has a description but there are no studies for it. So I'm confused why it even got listed at all. Um, because when I say see more data, like it says, sorry, there's, we don't have any. So I'm a little, it seems like a, a sort of specific title to a study that's not there. Sir, I, I don't think see more data is necessarily linking to stata, to studies, it's are there other collections of data that are relevant or other dimensions of that particular indicator? Um, but that, that does sound like a glitch if you're getting a diabetes search result by clicking on the um, binge drinking indicator. And so we, we will check that. And there are ways in data share where you can let them know when you're encountering a problem like that. Um, and, you know, we can talk more in your one-on-one -on -one session about some of the specifics of how to, how to use this. But the main point I want to convey to all of you is that as Serge is saying, some of these, some of these are useful in some ways to his particular um, model and program that he's implementing, and some are not. And that is going to be true for many of you, if not most of you. And so again, this is not prescriptive. If, if, if and when it's helpful, great. 
but there's there's more data on data share than than is in the results menu. The results menu is intended to be a streamlined list that's connected to those core conditions based on all this input that we got. But we didn't want to put a hundred indicators under each core condition, um, and so feel free to back out of the results menu and use data share as a whole if you if you find that an easier way to approach the issue. And there may be things that aren't on DataShare. So DataShare is a platform that's maintained by Healthy Communities Institute. It's a license that our county buys for all of us to share these data and make them make it more like one-stop shopping to look for these things instead of having to go to the California Department of Health Services to look up immunization data and, and having to go to the criminal justice database and look up those things. They're trying to make it so that we can all find things more easily, but that doesn't mean everything is here or everything is here in the same way or level of detail. I mean, different data sources collect things in different ways with different um, timeliness. So, so Serge, you're right that the more you poke around in here, the more, the more you're going to find, but also the more frustrated you may be initially. And, you know, Nicole and I, always feel that that while um, this does eat up some time um, playing around with the features of data share, it also rewards time spent. So if you are if you have a particular question, we encourage you to bring those to some of our um, group uh, training and TA sessions and the individual TA sessions that are on offer as part of the core RFP. But there are also some great tutorials on here and if you're new to data share, um, highly recommend spending a little time learning these features, but th that doesn't mean that it's perfect or that there are, aren't going to be an occasional glitch um, with this much data, so. Okay, thanks. And, and Nicole's got a specific answer to your, um, to your question about the. Yeah, I see the question on my screen. I'm looking at adults who binge drink and I'm clicking on it and so I'm not quite clear what the, it could be a, a conversation we have somewhere else, but yeah, I'm definitely, it's taking in that one specific thing. It keeps taking me to diabetic monitoring. Um, mm. But if I click on the information next to it, compared to prior value, compared to trend over time, those mm. take me. So I don't know. Okay. Well, let's Maybe. puzzle through that one. We, we'd love to cover one more tool with you in the time that we have left. So these are great questions. Um, I, I can see from those of you who are on camera who are, who are nodding or looking puzzled along with Serge, um, we know that there's a lot of commonality to these. And uh, we also will, will have more uh, training and TA coming up in addition to the, the group TA and um, individual one-on-one -on -one sessions. So keep those questions coming. Let's talk, um, at least give you an overview of the Promising Practices um, database on DataShare. And this is another work in progress. So let me share my screen and just show you, first of all, how to get there. So the Promising Practices database is under the Resources tab, right here. There it is, okay. And so, um, as I mentioned, DataShare is maintained by the Healthy Communities Institute um, and Conduent. And so we are one of over 150 different communities across the country that are participating, that buy licenses from HCI to have these DataShare platforms. So they're a mix of local data to our county and then state and national data sets. And one of the advantages of that, particularly in terms of this promising practices database is that Healthy Communities Institute, HCI, collects um, promising practices as they define them um, to include here from all over. So we have some that we've submitted. We've been very active in submitting um, local promising practices that they then review and include. And you can see their ranking methodology. Um, we, as Nicole mentioned, going over the continuum of results and evidence, we really, wish that they didn't use the term ranking because we really want to get away from that idea of low, medium, high, better or worse, and assigning values to these things. And that's why we use the word continuum. 
but they, that's what they use and that's what it is. So um, they, they have good ideas, effective practices and evidence-based practices in, in their version of the continuum. And that's why Nicole said we'd matched our continuum to theirs and added that emerging category. But if you go to the Promising Practices database, you will see um, nearly 2,400 different practices on here and you can search them. So there are, again, other clearinghouses, other compendiums of promising, effective, evidence-based, good idea kinds of practices and programs that you can search. But the point here was to try to streamline that and make it available in one place. And it can be really overwhelming at first because there's so much on here. Some of it is more out of date than others. And some of it has more detail than others. So like everything else on here, um, you know, it, it, it's going to vary depending on your particular topic or need, but it's certainly worth checking out. So let me just show you a couple of ways in the time that we have for how to move through this particular portion, um, this, this tool on DataShare and how it might be helpful to you in, as you're designing your applications for the core RFP or other funding requests. So I'm just going to show you a, a quick search. So I'm going to search homeless and see what that does. So that's narrowed. You can see here under the search filters, just searching in that database, in the Promising Practices database for things related to homelessness. We've got Santa Cruz County right here at the top because it's got a local one. Then it's got things from all over the country. But there's still 91 items on here. And I really don't want to go through 91 descriptions. And so I'm going to say that just hypothetically, I'm actually really interested in the effects of homelessness on women. So my program's really concerned about things that affect women. So I'm going to search for that. And now I've narrowed it down to seven results. And there's some that are specific to certain things like violence. And I know that's, that's an issue that both drives women into homelessness, but also to, to leave an abusive relationship, for example, but also is something that affects women who are living on the streets and are more vulnerable to violence. And so this program happens to be in San Francisco. So I'm just going to click on that and get a few more details about it. And so now I find out that this program has not much detail about it. So it's just telling me that 10 years ago, it had 400 women participating in it. So I might decide that I'm going to look it up and find out more about it. Or I might decide, you know, this isn't exactly what I was looking for but I can find related content for other indicators that might be related to what I'm looking for. I might find some local data that might include some things about women and homelessness, for example, some, some funders of this kind of work. And maybe I go back and say, maybe there's some other practices that the Promising Practices database thinks I should look at. So here's a, for example, a domestic violence intervention program. So that sounds related to women and violence. So I look at that. And then this one also might, might or might not be something that gives me the information I want if I'm looking for examples of different kinds of programs to implement, different kinds of outcomes that I could include in my application. So I can keep cycling through until I find one that works for me. Or I can go back to the, the database as a whole and see if I can widen the search because that seemed a little too narrow for this purpose. So what if I'm going to look for older adults and homelessness? And there are some subtopics here that also contain some searches. So for example, let's say I wanted to look at diabetes. And there is one in Kansas that's diabetes management for older adults who are experiencing homelessness. 
And this one has something that's interesting to me because it's got some information on the outcomes that this program tracked. So it's still somewhat dated, but it gives me some ideas of what they achieved. And so for example, I might wanna see if I can monitor A1C levels or, or work with a, a local healthcare provider who is tracking that and see if I can look at that outcome as well. So it's just giving me some ideas of where they saw their success and how I might wanna track the success of my program. So again, just as Serge was demonstrating, you might, might have to click through quite a few of these to get to the right, uh, to get to something informative, or you may not even get to something informative, but this is a place to look as a starting point for ideas. There are also um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has these community guides on different kinds of um, public health interventions and programs that are updated fairly regularly and have a lot of information and data with them. And so those are, those are listed here as well as a link. And again, as, as we demonstrated earlier, on just about every data share page, when you scroll down to the bottom, you get suggestions for other things. So in this case, more indicators about diabetes and homelessness, more reports, local ones, uh, a toolkit, how to build a dashboard with all of these data together, a link to the Santa Cruz County's uh, community health needs assessment, and different funding opportunities that might be out there. So this is another one that is going to reward a little bit of exploration, um, but, but don't, uh, don't worry if you don't find an exact match, it still can be useful in, in generating some ideas or some threads to pull um, to find out more about what you could apply to your own program. Not required, um, again, in the category of if it's helpful to you, great, and if not, don't worry. Ready? That was a very quick tour. <laughs> Any questions about that? Or does anybody wanna try entering their programs and see what, see what happens while we have a little time together? Hi, you guys. You know, I'm sorry I had to have my video off this whole time. I'm not sure what's going on with my link. It's very frustrating, but every, I don't, don't I worry. We, be, we often yeah. have those situations. Oh, well, that's cool because I just don't like to. I, I felt like I was being rude. Um, I appreciate oh. your guys' time. The, um, the, the platform is so loaded with so much information. Um, I can understand why it's a little bit overwhelming for for some of us. However, the payoff for playing around and digging in and uh, man for verbiage, for uh, specificity, all the different things, it's just so loaded and it is worth the time of, uh, of squirreling around in there. So I would just encourage everybody to, uh, you know, just play around with it and uh, I just have to remember, I'm not going to break anything. <laughs> keep doing it. You're keep definitely not going to break anything, Elaine. Yeah. And Elaine, yeah. you're always so positive. <laughs> really appreciate that. And, and it is a fine line between loaded and overloaded. Um, but we, and we go back and forth ourselves. So, um, so yeah, just oh, I bet. thanks yeah. for that reminder. And, um, and we have, this has been a tour um, a whirlwind tour of a lot of things, a lot of clicks, a lot of sub menus, a lot of drop downs um, in just a couple yeah. hours together. So we get it. Um, and really, this was just to show you what's there under the surface um, for you to explore when you have a little more time or inclination, and just so that you know that it's there um, for, for the mining. <laughs> yeah, it's a plethora. It, it really is. It's a uh... And I just learned all kinds of stuff today that I didn't even know was there, you know, you know, uh, I'm excited to just go really in and dig. So thank Great. you, ladies. You are welcome. Um, we have another poll to share with you and I'm gonna share slides one more time. And then I'm gonna tell you about some of our upcoming events as well. Um, so Nicole is putting a poll up about how likely you are to use these tools in your 
um, core application. So there's a question for each tool. So if you scroll down, if you're if you're if this is tiny on your screen, um, the first one is the results menu. The next one is the strategies and program outcomes menu. And then we have the core continuum of results and evidence. And then finally, the promising practice practices database that we just showed you. So they're in the order in which we showed them to you today. Okay. Great. So I'll give another second for responses to come. I don't. I, I can't find the poll, so Serge will take the poll for me if he can. <laughs> okay. Elaine broke the internet. Um, uh, yeah. That's so frustrating. Oh, Serge. Hey, you don't know Elaine. I'm just saying. So. I know. I, I know Elaine doesn't need to hear that. <laughs> no, he does. We're, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's been helping me all morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're yeah, on the very yeah. light. Yeah, God bless Serge, really. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Um, you got like, uh, like this is some data available through this one organization on data share. There was um, your, your, um, the other, Nicole was mentioning a couple other places looking for specific information like health information or justice information. Yes. Could, would that be something that you guys could share, like a few of those kind of things that you guys know about? So if we can't find what we want on data share, like we can go do like extra research because I don't know that many of those kind of lists. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, Serge, why don't we talk about that in our in our one on one? Yeah. And then um, I'll, I'll try and do some prep work before we before we talk. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, they're customized to, to the Recovery Cafe. And and if others have that kind of question too, we can- Yeah, I think that might and, be to other people and they wouldn't be so frustrated like that data share doesn't have what they want if they knew that they could find it in other places. That's yeah. awesome, I have that's to say, a great data, suggestion. Data share is a, a great head start though. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, and then the other thing about data share is like the promising practices database is they really look at things that that have to meet certain criteria like they have to be collected at regular intervals it's not just a one off data collection. Um, so there might be other things out there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're better or more suited or more detailed so every everything has its pros and cons, but yeah, for yeah. what I but definitely we can look at that. Yeah, for what I was looking at on substance use stuff that's really changed in the last year and fentanyl and stuff, it was really low on that kind of data. Yeah, so things that are super recent might not have made it through the, the pipeline here, um, but I have some ideas for you, so. Awesome, thank you. And fentanyl in particular, okay. And oh, perfect, so, thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. And so speaking of office hours, et cetera, um, and one-on-one -on -one TA, so we're at the top of this screen here doing our um, using core tools to develop your proposal. And then we have some office hours tomorrow uh, that are general group office hours. There is a workshop um, when, when everyone's back from various holiday breaks um, on January 12th. And Reviewer is the online platform that the county is using to collect the applications. So it's important to know how to use that sooner rather than later. Um, there was an earlier workshop, but it, people may not have been ready to, to participate in that, but um, that January 12th one would be a good one if you're, if you're planning on moving forward with an application and haven't already uh, registered. Then um, we're gonna do a, a couple of trainings, same one repeated on January 11th and 13th on specifically, specifically working with those outcome statements and evaluation tools with an equity lens. So all the questions that came up on the continuum of results and evidence, as well as the program outcomes and strategies, we're gonna get a deeper dive into some of that in, in that January uh, pair of trainings on the 11th and 13th. Um, just note they're longer, they're three hours. One is in the morning and one is in the afternoon. And then we are gonna have one that's specifically about combining 
different kinds of data to tell a story and learn. So that one will be the following week on January 18th. And that one will be one in the morning and one in the afternoon on the same day. So you can, you can do a comparison of whether we're better in the morning or the afternoon. And then um, January office hours are, um, are open as well on the 14th, 19th and 26th at various times. And you can sign up for all of that in the link that Gisela is gonna put in the chat. And we hope to see you at one or more of those events, but we can't let you go without one more poll. And we do really um, use your feedback in these. We're, we're holding a lot of these sessions and we need to know whether they're um, meeting your needs. And so please, please take the time to answer one last poll or feedback survey, and then we can all go about our day. And thank you for being here and for, um, for leaning into discomfort with the some, somewhat overwhelming tools and we'll, we'll, we'll all get there, but just appreciate your, um, your interest in, in the core tools and helping us um, think about how to make them even more useful in the future.